Hello, my dear students. I hope everyone is doing great. I am Dr. Dilsora Fazilova. Please call me Dilsora if you wish. Uh, this is our first class, and I am going to review the main concepts and theories in sociology. In a way, this kind of lays foundation for understanding more complex phenomena in our next uh, video lectures or asynchronous uh, lectures. So what I'm going to do today is um, I will talk about sociology briefly, and I will be talking about social institutions, social structures, socialization, and uh, main sociological perspectives. So in our next classes, we have uh, something to start with. So we will use these structures or we will use these perspectives to understand the uh, rest of our course. So thank you for being here. I know it's a summer session and everybody wants to be out having fun. And you're here stuck with me reviewing some sociological uh, perspectives and we will be talking about um, some more complex uh, phenomena in sociology. So that means you are go getting ahead and getting your credits towards your degree. That is great as well. So what I'm going to do is I will start with uh, what is sociology? What are social institutions? What is social structure? And what is socialization? What are the main perspectives in sociology? So this is going to be the main focus of our class today. So sociology is basically one of the social, uh, social sciences. It's a discipline that examines human behavior, human society, or social world. Sociologists interested with everything that is interconnected with humans that can be economics, we go and do some work and we will get paid. And our lives are very, like economics is very important for our lives. There's a history where we started and where we are going. How did social change happen? And what kind of factors affected human societies in the past? Psychology, there is a, one part of psychology called uh, social psychology that is kind of looks at society and tries to understand what is going on in people's minds and what's affecting them, what's changing their mind. There are polit there there is political science that is part of uh, human society as well. We have uh, political ideas. We live in a, a political world so we are interconnected with that there's geography there's culture so, so sociologists are basically interested in all these aspects of um, society the sociology is basically the systematic study of human society and it it, it came from a latin societies which means society and the logos in Greek literally means world. So in a way that it's a social world. Um, sociology is also linked to the word socius, which is companion. So that is about relationships. So when we think about sociology, we are thinking about all aspects of society. So for, we are starting from the individual and then groups, and we are thinking about the larger society and the societies as a whole. So there are all different kinds of views. We can think about, for example, uh, micro-level uh, sociological studies like for example symbolic interactionalism looks at individual relationships with other individuals that symbols that we socialize with and then there's a macro level um studies which looks at society as a whole or it's a more 
uh, general perspective on society. And there are social institutions, and probably all of you know what social institutions mean. So social institutions are, for example, family is a social institution. Education, religion, economy, government, healthcare, media, justice system, law, military. If you look every each of them, you can see that they have some sort of structure and they have function in society. For example, family can be all different kinds of structures. There are single family, single parent families. There are nuclear families, which is mother, father, and couple kids. And there's extended families. There can be grandmas and grandpas and um, aunties and, you know, let's say uncles. And there are um, blended families, for example, stepdad and stepmom. So family as an institution has its own structures and it plays very important role in society. So because of the families, there is organization in society. People know whose kid is who and, and we kind of administer, ad, administration, for example, social administration, Takes, in, uh, takes note of everybody and everything and families. So there is one of the main functions of family is socialization. As children are born in our families, they study how to socialize with other people. They will learn basic human relationships, how to say hello, how to be a friend, how to dress, how to eat, how to clean after the, themselves. So that is part of socialization. And then another very important role of families or marriages is reproduction, for example. These are the, the functions of family. So one of the institutions in society, we can just take a course and study all about one institution. And there are so many of these institutions, all of them have some sort of um, structure and function in society. For example, education, you will go and um, study how to read and write, and you go to higher education, you will become a professional, and then you enter to economy that you are working and supporting your family and also becoming a good um, profession, professional. All these social institutions are interconnected and everybody in society um, just uh, has some sort of relationship with certain other uh, social institutions. For example, as I mentioned, families raise children they go to educational system, and then they might practice religion. Then they start working, and then they will support their families. There's a government makes laws and regulations. There is healthcare system if somebody gets sick, right? And there's a media, and, and there's a social media. There's a justice system if somebody does something wrong, and they can be taken into justice system and punished. There, all, there are institutions of law that makes um, norms or uh, set up certain principles in society. And there, there's a military. So all these social institutions work together in society. <clears throat> Each of these institutions have their own norms. For example, when you're in the family, you know what is right and what is wrong, what is a norm in the family and what is deviating from that norms. You know where to have dinner and you know how to dress, you know how to uh, talk to your family members. That is the norms unwritten, but over time it became part of family. So every each institution in society has their own norms and people interact with one another through those norms. 
Norms are great because we understand one another very easily. And then we are familiar with everything in society. For example, if we go to religious places as mosque or um, church or anything else you call it. So when you go there, you know what to do. That signs, that symbols, that norms makes it familiar. So people will easily interact with one another knowing those symbols. So those are called social norms. We share the social norms or communicate the social norms through socialization. So what is socialization? Socialization is a lifelong process through which individuals typically within a society or culture learn and internalize the values, norms, customs, behaviors, and social skills necessary for effective functioning within that society. So basically, we learn from our families how to be at home. We will learn from our colleagues and rules and regulations in economy how to act at work. We learn from other people how to come to Tim Hortons and buy our coffee, maybe stand on the line, get our coffee, and then pay for it, and either sit there and have your breakfast or lunch, or leave uh, with your food. Those are the social norms created over time. <clears throat> like soccer or hockey. When you go or when you play soccer, you have all the rules and regulations in that um, game. So you act accordingly, right? It's a dynamic and ongoing process that begins in early childhood. We teach the child how to hold the spoon, how to say hello, how to call somebody, or everything they need to um, function in society. In, from the early age, they will learn to make friends, play with other people, socialize, and take part in our families. The key aspects of socialization is a foundation, it's a foundational process that helps people or individuals to adapt to their social environment. So they will learn they will have a sense of belonging and they have a shared identity. So there are people that somehow similar, they're from same family, from same background, and maybe they work in the same place. So they have a shared identity and active or effective participation in a broader uh, society. So for transmission of culture from one generation to another, socialization plays a very, very important role. We also develop our identity, who we are, what's our religion, where we are coming from, what is our relationship with other parts of society and our social skills, internalization of norms, what we learned from home, from our families, from our surroundings. And there are agents of socialization. For example, family is the main, one of the main agents of socialization that parents teach their children how to speak and how to you know, walk and how to talk and how to do things. Also meantime, we pass our culture to our children. So that is called cultural, cultural uh, reproduction. So then, what is a social structure? So we looked at the social institutions, like let's say each of these one is our social institutions. So there is a family, there's education, there is religion, there's healthcare system, there's a government, politics, and all of those social institutions are interconnected. So each of these institutions has their own norms, roles, like everybody plays certain role. And don't get me wrong, when I say play, 
actually that is the role. For example, in your family, your father plays the role of a father. He goes to work, brings money, provides for your family. Your mother goes to work, provides for your family, also takes care of small children, let's say. Everybody have their own role within family. So then social structure is this norms, institutions, and how everybody interacts one another, their structures and their functions through socialization. So in society, everybody has a role. For example, as a student, you have a role. You come to school, you come to university, there is a seat for you in your class, and there is an instructor teaching you sociology or math or chemistry. So the part of the society, as part of the society, some resources are distributed to you in the educational system. So social structure is basically the all everything, the structure of society and how we interact with our surroundings. So there are roles, there are values, and we interact through, through those roles and regulations and um, norms and socialization in society. In other words, based on everybody's roles, the resources are distributed in society. For example, as a student, you can come to university, you have a seat, you have an instructor, you have books, you are provided with these resources so you can learn and become a professional and enter the economy to contribute to society. Sometimes I feel there is a little bit of a confusion between understanding of culture in society. So let's review what is so culture and what is society. Culture is basically refers to a shared beliefs, practice, practices, material artifacts within social groups. For example, in one group, they share, let's say, religious beliefs. Also, they have certain way of living. They they have certain way of clothes. They have certain way of making their food and they have certain way of building their houses. That is culture, okay? So culture can be material culture or non-material culture. Material culture or basically that you can uh, touch with your hand, that it can be let's say your home and clothes and and the food and all of those are material culture. What is non-material culture? Non-material culture can be music. It can be expression, certain uh, cultural expressions and belief systems. Those are non-material cultures. Society, on the other hand, is a group of individuals interacting within a common bound, bounded territory or religion. For example, Canada is a sort of bounded territory or region where all different cultures live, live within um, Canadian society, right? Canada is a society and there are many cultures in society. So there are social structures, there are social processes, social organizations of people who share all these cultural elements, all different cultural elements, and they live in one society. So then what is sociological perspective? So when we think about sociological perspective, we need to just say like how sociologists see society. What is important about that way of seeing society? Sociology 
helps us develop a sociological perspective. So sociological perspective, I would start with a beginner's mind. It's a very helpful concept. What beginner's mind means is just um, going with the basics that all this belief system as you learn through socialization in, uh, in the family, and then you keep going to keep going to develop them in uh, educational system and then and then then economy so you have your own understanding of the world the beginner's mind is just leaving all of them out and and looking at a phenomena or something wanting to learn you just need to push all our belief systems and look at that new uh, phenomena or something happening in society, wanting to learn and wanting to see it from a fresh perspective. That is a beginner's mind. And I will be talking about sociological imagination um, in a bit. I want to discuss that a little bit more because that will be very helpful to understand our class. I actually really like Berger and Lukman's Invitation to Sociology, Social Construction of Reality piece because it talks about how can we see the general in particular. For example, if you see something in society which is very particular, you can think of that same uh, structure or same frame can be applied in some other places. You can also use that frame to see or use that lens to see other societies, other uh, relationships or other groups. So that helps us to generalize the knowledge in sociology. Also sociology is about seeing the strange in the familiar, for example, what are social norms? How people follow social norms? How breaking social norms happen? And how those new social norms come to society and we start a social change? Those are the things we can start with beginner's mind and question if we want to understand uh, sociology well. Also seeing personal choice in social context. You make choices because those choices are available for you. Or the other factors in society helps you to decide for that. There are many things in society without us knowing or acknowledging them affects our choices. As a sociologist, we try to understand all of this um, in, as part of society. So as I already mentioned, there are few um, very important ways of studying sociology. We learn microsociology. It starts with self or individual, individual interactions and socialization. There are roles in society. Those are all microsociology. And we do qualitative research to understand uh, microsociology. Also, there is a mesosociology that is in between that microsociology and microsociology. So that is our, that uh, mesosociology study is more in the group level. It goes both like more general and particular. And macrosociology is a structural study of society. We do, for example, statistics to learn about um, how many children are being born every year and how many people are dying every year. And then we kind of calculate and figure out what might happen in the next uh, 10 years or 20 years, right? And that's kind of like a social prognosing. So those are the different levels we 
looked uh, look at in society. So now I am going to talk about um, very important people you need to know in sociology, which we will be more or less uh, talking about them in the rest of our course. So this is Karl Marx. He is one of the uh, found, uh, foundational fathers of sociology. Um, probably many of you know him from his conflict theory that he says the society is in, in every level there are conflicts. Conflicts are not always bad, but Karl Marx looks at more class struggles, inequality, how conflicts develop and how conflicts need to be taken care of. Like he, he kind of encourages revolution and changing the social structures or he talks about capitalism. And there is Max Weber. He talked about bureaucracy and rationalization. He talked about iron cage. This is more um, starting with the enlightenment uh, society has started to change and all the sociologists were trying to understand what really sociology is and we can how can we understand it better, right? There are Irving Goffman, he talks about roles or stages in society and there is um, George Herbert um, Mead and also Augusta Comte is one of the scholars that brought the uh, word sociology, um, coin sociology, and he was a social positivist. So what does it mean is basically he wanted to apply the natural sciences, the research in natural sciences to society to understand society. It's more like, you know, that knowing how many people are living in society and and how and structural changes happen and all of those like a positivist or calculable way of studying society. And Harriet Martino, he, she is uh, one of the very important people in sociology. Um, she was an activist, she wrote books. We will be talking about her books. Uh, Spencer uh, talked about social Darwinism, and Durkheim is uh, uh, the scholar who explains structural functionalism. To just broadly see how everything started in sociology, uh, this really helps. It's kind of like a, a little picture is like a children uh, draw, but um, but but I think this is really good to understand basics of sociology. For example, it talks about 1800s. It's kind of like a positivist way of looking at society and trying to understand uh, society from that perspective. And then there is uh, uh, Augusto Comte, coined sociology. And then there was Spencer, there was Durkheim. And there's Karl Marx. Um, Karl Marx just took the Hegel's ideas and tried to explain in different ways, like a, um, the dialects, the, the histor historical materialism, for example. And then there is another line of um, system of scholars um, took other, uh, the interpretivism, for example. Weber is here, sorry, this is just keep changing. So this is basically the first upper part of this picture is classical sociological theory theorists and the bottom is starting to be um, contemporary sociological theorists. We like to learn about Marcuse's, Marcuse's writings and there is Goffman, Bourdieu, um, there, there is... Uh, Talk of person, persons we study a lot, and then fruit more like uh, social psychology. And there's the Frankfurt School. So my slides keep changing back and forth. I better move on then. 
So when we talk about sociological perspectives, we usually start with structural functionalism, conflict theory, symbolic interactionalism, and feminism or critical theory. So I will briefly talk about every each of them. Uh, structural functionalism looks at society as there are structures and they have their functions. When I explain social institutions, I just kind of said like social structure is basically the social institutions and how they interact with one another through socialization. There are norms in society. Every institution has their own nor norms, which at the end uh, makes the whole societal norms. There are values, there are roles in society. Everybody has their own role in institutions. So structural functionalism looks at society as a human body. For example, let's say just let's just pick a human organism and name them with um, social institutions. Let's say your brain is a educational system and your heart is a family. Your liver is, let's say, laws and regulations or government. So each of them has their own structures and then their own functions. All of the structures and functions together and their functions together keeps balance in society. So if they do their job, society should be all right because everybody does their own job. There's a social change. And if the norms are broken, then, then uh, there's the, it's, they start to change. So structural functionalism explains society as very important structures and they have their own functions. And the second theory we looked at it is a conflict theory. Basically, when structural functionalism explains society, it was a big deal. People start to understand what society is. And then Karl Marx came along and he said, really, this is not enough. Uh, we need to understand the conflicts in society. Conflicts are the very important fabric of society. Without it, social change does not happen. Uh, Marx said uh, structural functionalism, criticized structural functionalism, saying structural functionalism cannot explain social change. So conflict theory, on the other hand, explains everything what happens in society in a sense that there that is based on conflicts. There is a conflict uh, in families. There is a conflict in uh, educational system. There is a conflict. There are many conflicts in economy. There are conflicts in religion. And when that happens, so conflicts make changes. For example, if there is a something and Apple products, um, there's a conflict between two companies that let's say Apple is making uh, iPhones and something is making similar phones. So because there's a conflict between them, they want to sell their own products, every each of them, they try their best to improve them. So their product is better than the product in other company. So also they try to make sure their product is cheaper than the product in their uh, opponent, right? So between these two, the conflicts make growth. Both uh, products advancing, maybe quality is getting better, Maybe there is a conflict between their prices and prices are getting lower. So all the changes in society, most of the changes in society happen because of conflicts. Conflicts are not really bad things. We need conflicts to 
improve our lives. Conflicts or negotiation when people are interacting with one another. But there are also bad conflicts. There is a wars in society, uh, political conflicts. There are conflicts make life is very hard. People are um, getting hurt because of the conflicts. So the main idea behind this lens is seeing society as having this uh, fabric of conflict. So the third school of thought or third main um, theory in sociology is symbolic interactionism. Symbolic interactionism is more looks at society from the micro level, which structural functionalism uh, looks at macro level. Conflict can be both macro and micro level analysis. Symbolic interactionalism says the society cannot be understood without understanding how people interact through symbols. The one of the main symbols we use in society is our language. So language is built over time. Now, when I'm talking to you, you understand what I am saying to you. Why? Every each word means something. If you, for example, uh, study Mandarin or study French or study, let's say, some other language, so you're familiar with that symbols and you can interact with people in, who talks in that language. Also, religion is a um, system of uh, many, many symbols. There are our clothes, there are our, our norms, all of them symbolize to something and that's how we function in society. That's how we understand one another. Without them, you can't really imagine society. The last one I want to mention is a feminism. So feminism uses different lenses, structural functionalism, conflict, symbolic interactionalism, to look at, let's say, gender, sex, um, religion, uh, race, all of them analyzes them through using these lenses to understand social inequalities in society. We will get into that in our um, next classes. So when we talk about sociological perspectives, we need to understand there is a classical sociological theory that is we called as roots of sociology. That is the main understandings of society, which is structural functionalism, symbolic interactionalism, and um, let's say um, conflict theory, and all those people who studied those main perspectives. And then in today's society, we call new theories contemporary sociological theories. Basically starts in 1930s and people try to understand or scholars try to analyze contemporary social life. It encompasses more recent perspectives and insights building upon a classical theories, but addressing current social issues and incorporating diverse approaches for announced understanding of today's society. We talk about many, many uh, scholars during our course, and I will address them as contemporary sociological uh, theorists. So the last thing I would like to talk is um, sociological imagination. What is sociological imagination? How can we think sociologically and what is the promise of sociological imagination? Sociological imagination, time travel, and discussion. That's what I'm going to do with you. So sociological imagination was introduced 
by um, C. Wright Mills. He lived 1916 and 1962. Uh, 1916 and 1962. I felt like I just repeated myself 60s here. He says, I'm, I'm reading this now because I want you to kind of like taste the language he uses uh, for this piece. He says, nowadays, men and women often feel that their private lives are a series of traps. They sense that within their everyday wor worlds, they cannot overcome their troubles. And in this feeling, they are often quite correct. What ordinary men and women are directly aware of and what they try to do are bounded by the private orbits in which they live. Their visions and their powers are limited to the close-up scenes of job, family, neighborhood. In their milieu, they move vicariously and remain spectators. So what he's saying is, he's talking about 1950s. That's when he brought this book, um, Sociological Imagination. He's saying there are certain things happening in society Often people think that's their choices, but actually the choices are predetermined or um, choices are dictated by society. People kind of following the society's expectations, requirements, and then blaming themselves and thinking what's going on, right? So that's the reason he's writing this sociological imagination. He says the task of sociological imagination is very particular. He says, what is personal troubles and what is public issues? That is the task of sociological imagination. We need to understand what personal troubles are and what public issues are. We now recognize that pri private troubles are very often public issues from which many people suffer. Our task is to understand the relationship between the two. This is task of sociological imagination, he says. Let's say you can think of yourself in a time travel. Um, it sounds interesting. So, so you sit in this machine or you have this clock that turns the time back, right? And then you kind of travel to middle ages or certain times in the past. And then all of a sudden you appear these different times. And your issues are different than what you're ex experiencing in your life here right now. You will learn about the societal norms at that time, values, think about structures. What are the predominant social, social issues that you went by time travel? What kind of skills you need to survive? What kind of relationships you need to make? What kind of values or what kind of, what do you need to be successful in that society? For example, think about the ancient, ancient Rome. Let's say you are a plebeian farmer that living outside of or outskirt of Rome at this time. And that time, what's going on in society? The Roman Empire is expanding immensely. You are a young man. Let's say you're taking care of family. You are a farmer raising some vegetables and crops. And you're trying to provide for your family. You're interested with what's going on at the time. You're interested with festivals at the time. And also you can be called to army any time. So that is the requirement of Roman Empire. So there are many wars. How do you feel about becoming a part of 
um, military in the uh, Roman Empire? Or are you scared of your life? What happens if you lose your life in one of those wars, right? Are you proud of becoming a member of or the soldier in that army? What are your goals? Put yourself in a position to feel that. What are the issues? What happens if you don't have a, enough crop on that fall? How you will feed your family? What kind of struggles do you have? What are you wearing? How that, how that feels wearing that clothes at that time? That's cultural and that is kind of, um, you know, that adapted to the weather and style and culture at that time. So to, to understand societal issues at that time, you need to think of being there and feeling in the body of people living in that society. So you can think of like, oh, I want to buy a you know, new iPhone if you're living in ancient Rome, for example. Or you cannot think about going to university and becoming psychologist or or some newer professionals, right? So that everything in society is interconnected and, and the, the individual is part of that society. If somebody in that society have their own troubles, maybe don't get along with family and fighting, that's their personal issues. But there are larger issues that is connected to society. Or think about the Industrial Revolution and what was going on at that time. If you are a young textile worker, and living somewhere in England, you moved from village to the city with a hope of finding a job. Because at that time, people are moving from being a farmer in big lands there and serving to that landowners to cities. And there is an immense dynamic growth in the cities. There is the manufacturing companies are shaping. As you know, there was a period of time that society got prepared to start this industrial revolution. People were making money and becoming rich people, so they have enough money on their hands um, to start this um, manufacturing companies and stuff, which we called primitive accumulation of capital, right? So you live with a bunch of people who work in the manufacturing company, you work long hours in the textile, and then you're operating noisy machines, and there are certain dangerous conditions to work, and you know, does the money you're making barely enough to support yourself or your family. So your issues, personal issues, are interconnected what is going on in society. To understand how people lived at that time, you have to understand the historical period, what is going on in society. So Mills talk about personal biography or personal life being connected with historical events or historical period. He argues that sociological imagination enables individuals to connect their personal troubles to larger social issues by understanding the intersections of biography and history. For example, if we want to understand the Black Lives Matter movement and um, police brutality towards um, Black African American people, then we need to understand the historical uh, experiences of these people, slavery, 
when they started, what kind of discriminations exist in society, and how things are changing, what is not changing. So if we don't understand or consider all these facts, we cannot really understand what is going on in society. So Mills calls it personal troubles and social issues. By adopting a sociological perspective, individuals can move beyond a narrow focus on their troubles or personal issues. They can understand or recognize the broader structural functions that are influencing their experiences. For example, if you're an international student starting their studies, your studies in Canada, that means that you have certain kind of issues that you might share with other international students. They pay more than local students that maybe introduces new layer of hardships for international students. Maybe that is um, produces some difficulties for the family, maybe produces some difficulties for finding housing and paying your tuition fees. All of those are um, social issues that coming from the rules and the regulations and how everything is how everything is set up in society. The personal troubles, if we look at the, uh, in the micro level, it can be the challenges individual faces, their own conflicts with other individuals, maybe alcohol or drugs or difficulties they experience in the relationships, maybe um, marriage failures or those kind of all different kinds of personal troubles, right? It can be health issues, financial difficulties, emotional distress, stress, or not being able to keep a job or alcoholism. Those are personal troubles. They perceived as individual problems and viewed in isolation from broader social context and social uh, structural functions. On the other hand, social issues, they are broad social problems that are rooted in structures, institutions, and inequalities in society. In this case, you can see, look at uh, George Floyd and blame him for what happened to him, saying like, maybe he had his own personal troubles and maybe he, was using alcohol or drugs, or maybe he wasn't working, maybe he was kind of rude towards the police or whatever it is. Like you can kind of uh, put that all this problem on his shoulder. But if we understand what's going on in society, if we understand this is not the first time happening to African American people, then we can connect historical problems with contemporary or recent issues. Systematic in nature, issues are systematic in nature and are shaped by historical, political, economic, and cultural factors. They can manifest as patterns of inequality, injustice, oppression, or marginalization or discrimination in society. So Mills tried to make us understand that neither the life of an individual nor the history of society can be understood without understanding both. Mills' sociological imagination is very, very important for the rest of our course. That's why I wanted to review this with you so you can reflect on sociological imagination as we progress in our course. 
So I will also invite you all to think about where you locate yourself in society or sociology and you. How can you assess truth about common sense? When we say common sense, what really common sense is? Can you see opportunities in constraint that are constraining in our lives without blaming yourself for everything? Can you see the opportunities that our societies are creating? For example, globalization or um, global changes in race, recent decades allowed people to, for example, more freely mobilize around the world. Maybe if you're living in, let's say, Africa or Central Asia or Europe, you can come and study in Canada or uh, USA, right? Those are the opportunities created by our societies. And also there are constraints in our lives. Can you see them as a part of society? You can be empowered by active participating in, in our society. Sociology also helps us live in a diverse world. So you can think about um, society through sociological imagination or sociological perspectives, understand current issues and participate in addressing them. So basically sociology is another way of thinking or in a way thinking another world is possible. So this is our um, first review class. If you have any questions about anything I discussed with you, uh, I will open up a um, discussion group and we can chat in that. For now, my first lecture is done. Have a great day. Bye-bye.